tonight we are going to be discussing artificial gravity in science fiction. And just to give a quick plug and a thank you to Nerd Night LA, I've given a few talks there now. Uh, it was one of the first things I got plugged into when I moved to Los Angeles. And it's great because I give so many talks at particularly sci-fi conventions that it's usually like after a panel or after something that, you know, I... I've heard a lot, these Q and A's and nerd nights, the only event that I go to where I kind of have those like speaking jitters and I'm kind of nervous and I'm kind of focused on my talk. And then I get a drink in my hand and I get so absorbed in like what other people are talking about that I completely forget. And I end up learning so much and uh, unless I'm first and then... <laughs> forget all of that. And then I can like de-stress after everyone else finishes. So it's really, really fun and definitely one of my favorite events. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. And I hope you enjoy this talk. So before we can talk about our favorite science fiction franchises, we need to talk about artificial gravity and um, what gravity is before we can talk about how it's used in science fiction. So most people, when they think of gravity, they tend to just think of Isaac Newton and that gravity is a force, which is fair. I think that's kind of where a lot of people stop when they have learned science, they go into something else in, in the world and they're like, oh yeah, apple on the head, things fall down, whatever. It's a force that falls off as something and it makes me cry and don't ask me any more questions. Um, Isaac Newton had that idea that gravity was this force and between two objects, so you have two objects and they have this force that pulls them together that is dependent on how massive those two objects are and how far, how apart, how far apart they are um, by the distance squared. So if it's two times further away, the force of gravity drops by a fourth. If it's three times as far away, it drops by a ninth. And this held for a really, really long time. And because it applies to 99% of the stuff that we see in our everyday lives, that's what we're always taught. It works. You can do the math, you can do the calculations, fine, we're golden. Um, but as we were starting to learn more, and as we were starting to advance our knowledge a little bit, that actually started to fall apart because we were watching the orbits of planets in our solar system and we realized that Mercury processes around the sun and precession is just what you see here. It's like it traces a flower shape as it goes around the sun. And that doesn't work for Newtonian gravity. If you just took Mercury and you took the sun and you try to get them in orbit around each other, they'll, they'll orbit and Newton's law of gravity fit Kepler's laws of planetary motion very nicely, except for this. This idea of precession just doesn't work with Newtonian gravity. And telescopes were pretty good. There's always this interplay with astrophysics and like observational astronomy and theoretical astrophysics, because we can just use what the universe gives us. There's not a lot that we can actually do in a lab. It's what we can observe in the sky and apply it to the physics knowledge that we have. So in this case, there was that like, well, maybe there's something there that we're not seeing that could explain this. And so they realized that if you stick with Newton's law of gravity, you need to have another planet there that would um, cause this tugging, that would cause this procession. And because I'm <laughs> inextricably linked to the Star Trek franchise, I have to give a shout out for this because I kid you not, that proposed planet was called Planet Vulcan. <laughs> and this is a solar system chart from the 18th, uh, from the 1800s that actually have has Planet Vulcan in there. And that's what they thought could cause Newtonian gravity to work with Mercury's orbit. Um, then of course, along comes Einstein. And uh, Einstein, you know, stupidly smart dude. Like it's a little bit unfair. And I, that's a whole other talk to talk about all of his contributions to physics. Um, but one of the things that he contributed was this idea of space time, this idea that gravity is a um, sheet. It's like you took a trampoline and that trampoline is a four dimensional space time sheet. It's like 
our universe is four dimensional, that it's three dimensions in space, one dimension in time. And when you introduce a mass, it bends it like a trampoline. Um, so I have to play this clip really quick. But then I said that that frame of reference, that works. the perihelion of Mercury would have processed in the opposite direction. <laughs> that is a great story. <laughs> Quite amusing, Dr. Hawking. You see, Sir Isaac. So <laughs> really quick, that's basically breaking down. Um, I mean, the joke is solid, right? Because it is talking about that perihelion of Mercury. That's exactly the procession thing that they're discussing. So when it comes to space time, um, this unfortunately becomes less and less of a relevant reference because not many people have seen this episode now, which makes me really sad. But this is a perfect depiction of what space time is. It's um, this sheet of three dimensional space, one dimension in time. You introduce a mass, it warps and stuff you know, uh, follows this path. So when Einstein first proposed this, he put the mass of the sun in space time, it curved the space time around it, and then you introduce Mercury and the precession is actually a pretty natural thing to happen. Um, any of you who've played with, you know, gravity wells and science museums, you can make that happen pretty easily. You can get like a marble or a quarter or whatever to process around the center, no problem. Um, so he did the math and was like, woohoo, it worked. And uh, then took, you know, a couple days off work, whatever. Um, then they did some tests later to see that light curves around the sun. That was a famous eclipse that happened in... Uh, 1919, where they saw that. And now we use light curving around gravitational objects all the time. Um, this is an image from Hubble where we see galaxies in the background curve around. And then um, most famously, this is the uh, idea that when objects are rotating around each other, they actually send ripples in space time, which was theorized by Einstein, Einstein in 1915. And then in 2015 was detected by the LIGO collaboration. I did my PhD research with, but I left in 2014. So don't ask me questions about that. I'm fine. All right. So moving on. Um, let's talk a little bit about how gravity works. And um, if you can imagine gravity like a baseball, so artificial gravity, let me take a step back. Um, <laughs> I'm used to the 20 minute limit. I'm trying to cut it down really fast. So if we think about astronauts in space, we think about them being weightless, but they're not weightless because they're in space. They're weightless because they're falling around the earth. And the idea is, is that if you threw a baseball, it goes a certain distance and then it falls. And then if you throw it even harder, it goes a little bit further and then it falls. And if you throw it really, really hard and really, really fast, it's going to start to fall, but the earth is going to curve away from it because the earth is round. And then it will never hit the ground because it's moving too fast and the earth will um, fall away before it hits the ground. That's what the International Space Station is doing. So that's why astronauts are weightless. It's like they're on a constant free fall terror ride, which actually sounds horrible. Um, but it's really important to note that gravity is going to be necessary for any long-term space travel that we actually want to have um, because it can have pretty detrimental effects to the body for prolonged periods without any space. Um, I'm going to skip over that. So having artificial gravity in space, there are a couple ways we can do that. One is this idea of artificial gravity from rotation. And this is how they train astronauts and fighter pilots, put them in a centrifuge. Uh, you have centrifugal force. It essentially is like your body wanting to keep going in a straight line, but you're turning. So you're pulled to the outside. Um, thanks inertia. And that can artificially increase your gravity. And we see that in 2001 a Space Odyssey. That's how they do this rotational artificial gravity. And then we saw it most recently in The Martian. And they did a great job with how that could practically be applied to space travel, where we have this core center and then we have this rotating uh, area around it. And then they live, exercise, and all of those things in the areas where um, they have artificial gravity. So why don't we have this today? There's a couple reasons. One is in order to have Earth gravity, you have to have either a really big rotating space station uh, that doesn't rotate very fast or a really small run rotating quickly. It's expensive to sp send stuff into space. So the big one is kind of ruled out. The little one can give you some serious vertigo because your height is a good portion of that radius. So if you move around at all, 
you're done. Um, thanks, Cor Coriolis forces. <laughs> so uh, that's why we don't have it yet. But practically, that's definitely something we can have for artificial gravity. We also seen as in uh, that was the Ring World series. And then in Babylon 5, they have rotating space stations as well. And in Mass Effect, uh, the Citadel, actually, the Presidium has a rotating space station for artificial gravity. Fun fact. Um, in addition to the other stuff they have. Now, um, the Expanse does a great job of another method of artificial gravity, which is linear acceleration. Basically says the acceleration due to gravity on Earth is 10 meters per second every second. So why don't we take a spaceship and accelerate it constantly at 10 meters per second every second. And then when you're halfway there, flip around and decelerate at 10 meters per second every second. Science, that's fine. There's no problem with that. The problem with it right now, though, is that in order to have an acceleration, you need a force because force equals mass times acceleration. And that requires a ton of fuel. In the expanse, they explain it by having the Epstein drive, which is like this super fuel efficient way. So a little bit of fuel can allow you to accelerate for so far. So they explained it. But like with our knowledge of fuel right now, like there's no way we could actually do something like that. And then we have franchises that don't have either. And if they want to explain it, they don't know how to explain it. They try to have uh, gravity generators due to superconductors, which very much dates Star Trek into the 1980s when they, they use that as an explanation because superconductors were the end all and be all then. Uh, we have Mass Effect, which does do a great job, very complicated explanation of how you can run a current through a fictional element called element zero, which generates dark, it creates what does it do? It generates dark energy to simulate an increase or decrease in mass. So it creates little gravity wells um, using element zero, which is pretty cool. Um, and then I did a fun video for Half-Life um, or for extra credits about how the gravity gun in Half-Life would work, which again is all about generating like little micro gravity wells, which is super duper fun. So you should definitely check that out. And on that note, I think I have about 15 seconds to go. <laughs> Uh, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I really appreciate it. I, if, yeah, thanks. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.